sticking on the tipping. I know you've got a lot to talk about, but we're sticking on the tipping because people want to back winners. Mm. Can you talk us through your selection process? And uh, um, if you're actually in your own for your own tipping, what would you your own personal betting? What, where, where would you start? Okay, so whether it's flat or, or jumps, as we go through the first few weeks of a season, um, I will have my little black book. And I'll start writing down horses that I've seen race. I'll look, watch every race every day at the end of the evening. And I'll put horses in my black book and I'll think, mm, this horse is better than it's shown there. Conditions weren't right. So many different factors weren't right for us. And, I, and I'll put that horse on my short list. And they will form the basis, the centre point of horses that I will tip and or back as we go through the season. If that horse is then declared next time out, and not all the factors are in its favour. I won't tip it and I won't back it. I think to be a winning tipster and to be a winning punter, you have to have an edge over the bookmakers. Because all the time, because of the percentage call of the bookmakers in the book, they will always have the edge over you. It's naturally going to be that way because, you know, 99% of the field are running for the bookmakers. You have that one horse, that one selection running for you. So for me to have a decent bet, and I very rarely do nowadays, um, everything has to be 100% watertight, it has to be in my favour, uh, and the edge has to be with me and not with the bookmakers, and that, that is the most important uh, umbrella factor when you're having a punt, when you're having a bet, when you're, ha when you're putting even a tip out. And when you come, you know, you come up with one of these selections, you know, very rare one, what sort of figure are you having on? Well, it all depends. I mean, a long time ago, 2006, I think it was, or 2008, I can't remember. Um, I went to, um, I went to uh, Paul Nichols' yard and I walked around with Paul and he was very nice to answer my questions. And I'd say, um, who's that horse there? Yeah, I like the look of that. I like, I like, I like, physicality of horse is very interesting to me. Makeup of a horse is interesting to me. And I saw him school a few horses and I said, oh, that's a nice horse. Looks like um, he's very experienced, but he's a novice. I know he's a novice chaser, but he's, he looks very experienced. And he was a horse that came from France, where, of course, they jumped them very early on in their career. And it was a horse called Star de Mahaison. And I said, and I had a look at his breeding, and I spoke to Paul about it, and I said, he's going to want a trip, isn't he? Yeah, we're going to start him off over two miles, but he jumps brilliantly because of his French upbringing and the way he's been schooled. And I followed this horse very early on. I thought, they've got a plan for this horse. And you have to have confidence in what you think. Never be swayed totally by the words of a trainer or a jockey. They're the worst tipsters of all time. That's the cliche, and boy, they are the worst tipsters. You have to go by what you see, the evidence you see, both if you're lucky enough to see a horse work and on the track as well. Um, and all of a sudden, I knew, having looked at the entries, I thought... They're probably going to run him in the Sun Alliance chase, which is the three-mile novice chase, of course, the Brown Advisory now at Cheltenham. And I backed this horse from September through to February that year. Uh, and I didn't used to bet a lot, and I didn't need to. It was 33-1, 50, 50, 50, 33-1. And um, it won its two warmer prices at minor tracks. And I thought, why is this horse still 33-1? to 1? And I was doing continuity at Channel 5 at the time. And it came to the Sun Alliance Chase in March, and I had possibility of winning about £14,000 on the horse, just with five and £10 each way bets at 33s and 50s. And it was coming to the end of the film at the, in the afternoon at Channel 5, and when the, editor, the edits come up at the end, you have to talk over the edits. But that we're coming to the second last in the Sun Alliance Chase, and Stardom Hazon was ten lengths clear. And, of course, I was cheering in my studio. I had um, the the film on in one TV screen on Channel 5 and I had um, Channel 4 racing on the other TV screen and my director was going, cue Paul, cue Paul, edit, speak over the edits, push forward to the next programme, you're supposed to point to the next programme and I, I, was, I was going, come on stardom haze on and, I, and, and it won and I, I ran out of the studio and ran round the floor of the building, which is a massive building, about three or four times, punching the air. People looking out the offices thinking, this guy's absolutely lost it, big time. And they came back in and the director said to me, oh my God, you're in big trouble now. You missed talking over the edits of the, uh, the big film this afternoon. So I introduced the next programme, which was another hour. 
And my boss came down from Channel 5, head of broadcasting, and said, you're getting a written warning. And I said, yeah, but Stardom and Hazon was in the lead, and it was going to win the Sun Alliance chase. And she goes, Stardom what? Sun Alliance what? What are you talking about, Paul? I said, can I take you out for a drink tonight, boss? And she said, yeah. She was free that night. And I explained to her, and she just laughed her head off. She goes, I am going to have to give you a verbal warning, otherwise my bosses won't understand what went on. But in the end, she understood why. <laughs> and, and on those winnings, I went to Australia. Good man. And then finally, on the, on the punting, have you ever considered punting for a living? I, 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 there was a time where, when I, the press association went from Fleet Street to Hull, and I was the Telehex racing editor. Um, for about three or four months, I did, because then I went from being contracted to, to freelance. And I did bet for about three months. And, and I made, made a fairly decent profit, but I'm always scared of the fact that you can start with a really good bank and everybody goes on a bad run, even the, the best tipsters. I mean, for me, the two best tipsters, not professional punters, but the two best tipsters around, I think, are Rory DeLaghi and Paul Keeley. And they also go on poor runs, and I could never trust myself with that. But I'm lucky enough that I do stuff outside racing, like the voiceovers, like the TV and uh, radio presenting, that... I don't have to do that. That'd be a scary proposition. Right, we're going to go into that stuff now. So we're going to go back to your background. Born in Chester, brought up in Liverpool. Mm. Stayed one night in Chester because my mum wanted me delivered by a certain man. But we lived in Liverpool and he was based in Chester in a hospital in Chester. Well, it's not too far though, is it? No, just down the road. So, I mean, Liverpool is quite a different place back then. Some of it's quite deprived. I mean, how was your upbringing there? I was lucky. I came from a middle-class family. We lived in a nice part of Liverpool. Mum and Dad were great, very loving family, uh, one sister, one brother, and we had a heck of a time. Um, so I was kind of way privileged to a certain extent. I never went without anything. A um, lot of love, uh, grandparents, fantastic, big set of friends. Um, didn't entirely love school, but that didn't matter because football was my life. But uh, couldn't have had a greater upbringing. It always brings a smile to my face. I mean, it's interesting you talk about football um, synonymous with sort of Liverpool. Mm. I mean, you were a very good footballer, so had you not, you, you suffered a lot of injuries. Um, would you have ended up playing at Anfield if you'd not been injured? No, I wasn't good enough. Um, I played for Liverpool schools. I played for North of England as well, and I was on the cusp of getting uh, a little bit higher than that. And then I, I had a compound fracture of my leg. I broke it uh, at the age of 16, which was a real killer. And after that, I had numerous knee injuries. I'd snapped my medial ligament um, and had numerous operations. So even if I was good enough, I wouldn't have had any longevity in a career in football. I love playing football. I still play football now, uh, once a week, seven aside. And it's never out of your system. And a friend of mine came up to me about six months ago. He said, he said Paul, come and play with us. We're over 50s and we play walking football. And I just looked him in the face and I went, Walking football, I have to be in a wheelchair before I play walking football. <laughs> the day I can't run is the day that I give up football. And I love it today. I love watching it. I love playing it. I love kicking around just with mates. It's, it's the greatest feeling. So where did your love for horse racing come from? Horse racing, my granddad um, owned a horse. I didn't know the name of the horse, but he owned a couple of horses. And I would go around to his house on a Saturday afternoon. And I'd sit on his knee and we'd watch the ITV7. And it was great fun, you know, he used to have a little dabble. And then when I was about uh, 16, 17, I went to Jack Berry's yard in Cockerham in Lancashire. Um, and I had to walk around there. And it wasn't f from a betting point of view. It was these just amazing beasts, these just fantastic athletes. You were in awe of them. And each of them had a different characteristics. And I, and I go back to Jack Berry's yard every summer, have a walk around, muck out and just... You know, B, you speak to Kevin Darley, who then was the, the stable jockey, and once it gets in your blood, that's it. It's, it's just a tremendous industry, but it wasn't from a betting angle. It was because these animals were just there, and they still are just gorgeous, amazing creatures. Now, I was going to say that your introduction to broadcasting was very unusual, but having interviewed Bob Cooper recently, he's got a very similar story about how he got into broadcasting. You got a job working in a betting shop mm. um, and then with Labrooks and then they were looking for a broadcaster. Yeah, I, I actually uh, did my training in Old Street in Labrooks 
and by hook or by crook, uh, I passed. You have like a day where you have to do, basically, um, you become the shot manager for a day and you have to sort out all the bets. And on that day, it poured down. There were unbelievable amount of rule fours. My maths was no good. I just about screamed to CSE grade one in maths. And you have the district manager standing over you and you're trying to settle all these bets. And in those days, of course, it wasn't done automatically. You had a calculator and that was it. And I, I, I think you had to get something like 86, 87% and I got 83, 84. And he let me off because there were so many rule fours that day. So I passed, got my shop in Shoreditch in East London, which in those days was rough. I mean, today it's the place to be, you know, pubs, clubs, everything. But it was rough, and I was there for four or five weeks. And on a Friday, you do your paperwork in a massive ledger, and you try and make everything balance. I was in there Friday night, 10 o'clock, racing had finished, couldn't get it to balance, knock on the door, open the door. This guy comes in in a three-piece suit, striped suit, unheard of in Shoreditch, walked in. He said, lock the door behind you. I said, I, said, I take it from lab books. He said, yeah. And we started talking, and in and those days there were no pictures. There was just a blower. There was just audio. And he said to me, he goes, and we started talking, he goes, you've got quite a good voice. He goes, um, um, there's a training broadcaster job going up at uh, Harrow on the Hill at Labrook's head office. Why don't you apply for it? I said, I've never done anything like that before. And he actually said to me, what do you think of the, the audio coming through the speakers and the shot? They called it the blower in those days. And I, I threw at him a swear word and told him I thought they were, Blooming awful, but it was a bit stronger than that. And he goes, let me introduce myself to you. He goes, uh, I'm Alan Lee and I'm the communications director for Labrooks International, at which point I wanted the floor to open up in front of me. And he said, you know what, you've got nothing to lose. I can tell you don't like it working as a shop manager. Do yourself a, a tape, a cassette recorder it was in those days. Do your voice, send it up there. I did. And in four weeks later, I was a trainee broadcaster at Labrooks. So there's the luck thing coming in again at a huge sliding door moment. Did you ever get the, to utter the immortal words, making rapid late headway? Uh, well, when, when there was no pitches, you, you could like spin a furlong out for about 35 seconds, as they used to do in the betting shops. And that was the great fun of it, because if you were a punter, nearly every horse got a mention inside the final furlong, and you thought, yeah, I've, I'm still in with a chance. Um, yeah, and the answer to your question is yes, many a time. But every betting shop punter back in the day was <laughs> listening, listening for that. Um, I know, and then the hard earned money was riding on your words, you know? Yeah, we're going to talk about your, um, the rest of your broadcasting career in the next part, but would you say that because you got to watch so many races and you had to watch them quite intently, mm. that that was an aid to your tipping? Yeah, I think so. When you're, you're, when, you're actually betting, when you're actually working within the industry and you have to watch every race every day, if you have the wherewithal about you, you'll make notes if you take your punting seriously or, and or your tipping seriously. You'll make notes upon notes upon notes and you'll go back through them and you'll try and ha highlight the, when a horse comes up to her next time you'll, you'll harp back. I used to have um, a ledger that was that thick every year full of notes of horses. Of course, you didn't have computers in those days, or you didn't have the, uh, the, the uh, memory on the computers to put it all on, even the, the, sort of the old Commodore, I remember, coming out. So it was all handwritten, and it was all labour-intensive. So that's what you did. Uh, uh, and nowadays, if I do a day where I'm not doing work um, for a bookmaker within the racing industry, I have to then go home and catch up on every race that night. So it's hugely intense, hugely intense. But the, I mean, these days, everybody can do that, can't they? Yeah. But back in those days, you it was a bit of an edge for you no. to see all the races. Well, it, 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 it kind of, it was an edge, but you, you know what, Simon, you had to work very hard at it. You know, I knew people, I mean, I worked, I had a really good team underneath me at Labrooks in broadcasting. I had uh, Angus Lochran, Stato, and John Hunt, arguably the best horse racing commentator at the moment. And they weren't particular. Well, Angus was a big punter, but he didn't do it on form. It was on hearsay. He knew a lot of people. John wasn't a punter. And I was a punter, but I used to make notes upon notes. And Angus would turn around to me and he'd go, what are you doing that for? I says, I take my punting seriously. But we had two different ways of evaluating races and horses.